Welcome back. The Financial Times has ridiculed the administration of President Mohamed Buhari. In its latest publication, it noted that Nigeria has sleepwalked closer to disaster under him. In the article titled, What is Nigeria's Government for? David Pillen Yasser accused Buhari of not finding the solutions to the country's economic quagmire, insecurity, and electoral malpractices, having spent two terms. Now, reacting, Garba Sheho via his Twitter account wrote a letter to the editor of Financial Times seeking to correct the point highlighted in the article. He noted that Boko Haram now controls no territory. Joining us to discuss is Ife Wano, a security expert, and Shagun Shubita, a public affairs analyst. Many thanks for joining us, gentlemen, on this particular discuss. Thank you for having us. All right. Uh, the Financial Times uh, came out with some very mind-boggling uh, report about um, the nation's uh, economy, the nation's uh, security, and, of course, all that uh, have been happening with the uh, President Mohamed Buhari's administration in the past um, two uh, years. Uh, let me just quote something. I'll start with you, um, Shegun. Uh, David Pillin said uh, in his words, Buhari has overseen two terms of economic slump, rising debt, and a calamitous increase in kidnapping and banditry. The one thing you might have thought a former general could control, that's uh, about the banditry and kidnapping. Now, so basically, let's talk about the economic slump. Uh, you uh, follow the economy over time. How would you say the nation's economy has uh, you know, fed under President Mohammed Bari in their two tethers because uh, the Financial Times seem to think that um, the economy or the economy is slumping and our debts are just um, rising momentously. Yeah. Um, I, I, it's very, very hard to fault the position of the Financial Times. Um, you know, simply because if you look at the realities on ground, um, compare the various indicators from when uh, this administration came on board in 2015 um, to now, um, you find that the truth of the matter is that um, it, it's, it's not been cherry. You know, um, all of the indicators have almost all, not all, but almost all of the indicators have been pointing downwards. Um, whether you want to talk about GDP growth rate, um, unemployment rate, inflation rate, um, the exchange rate, you know. So if you just take all of those economic indices, the, those key economic indicators, you find that it's been a downward trend. Um, of course, you know, um, to ensure that one is balanced um, and there's a bit of uh, perspective to all of that, we must recognize the fact that there is a... Uh, global um, context to those events. Um, so first of all, because we have an economy that is dependent or a government that relies on revenues from oil, any time that oil prices sneezes, we catch all sorts of diseases as a country. And that's what happened to our um, GDP when we went into recession. Um, early 2015 into 2016, um, and you know, with the coming of COVID-19 and the global recession, we also went into a recession. So that is the context to 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 put all of this under. However, the point to note is that um, yes, those um, external factors were significant contributing um, 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 factors. Uh, pardon the repeat of the word. Um, but government duty would have been to um, come up with policies that would have mitigated the impact, you know, of those um, external factors to, to ensure that it, it didn't hit us as hard as it did, you know. So in that regard, uh, the government failed very, very woefully. And again, it must be said that, you know, it's been seven years. It's been seven years, you know. Um, time time does tend to fly by when things are interesting. It's been seven years, and I I, I, I find it difficult to argue, to to find any kind of argument that will support the inability of a government, any government at all, to make fundamental changes. Fundamental changes, if they are serious and they have the will, 
you know, to the structure of the economy, to the structure of the political system, and all of that, to ensure that the changes that need to be made can be made. You know, so this government has been just like the economic, uh, you know, um, the financial crisis. It's been it's been sleeping. You know, even at a point, uh, President Buhari even referred to himself as Baba Goslo, and he seemed to have taken it as a compliment. I don't understand. Nigeria's situation is a situation where speed, urgency, you know, and um, the precise, nimble decision making is required. But right. every decision gets you know, gets delayed by six months, by one year, you know, and, 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 and nobody's waiting. Time is not waiting. The rest of the world is not waiting. The economy is not waiting. Things are getting worse, you know. So um, in that regard, the, this, this, this administration has not done well at all. All right. Uh, over now to you, um, Afi. Uh, the Financial Times seems to um, have a bit of um, some expectations of um, the, the president uh, having um, been in the military for some time. And they thought that he should have been able to tackle uh, the issues of um, kidnapping and banditry, you know, knowing that he was a former general. But then again, the president he came out, uh, you know, in response and said that um, Boko Haram, you know, is not in control of any particular territory. Let's talk security now, Afe. Judging by what the Financial Times um, have said and the President's response, uh, how would you say that, or what direction would you say we are headed in terms of security? Well, I think that um, the Financial Times is absolutely on point. I mean, sync with their, their thinking with regard to what the uh, expectation of President Buhari's government. Um, you truly really have the same and perspectives, perception, expectation of President Buhari when he became the president in 2015. Not a few people thought that one of the low-hanging fruits of the president would be the issue of uh, tackling insecurity head-on, beginning from police reforms and then reforming and rethinking the entire security architecture. What we've had is basically a reactive position by the government of the day. Before the service chiefs were, were shown their way out, their tenures were extended, you know, it was not constitutional, it was not the proper thing to be done. And they kept them for over one year after they were supposed to have retired from service, or 35 years in service, the president left them. What would have thought, because the way security is structured, it's, it's a case of you give instructions, you take instructions. And as the commander-in-chief, the police and the entirety of our security apparatus, apparatchik, if you like, um, it's under the federal and exclusive list, it, you know. So the president, my expectation was that that would have been a low-hanging fruit. First few months, police reforms. Then the issue of retooling the military and intelligence agencies with regards to ensuring that what you have is proactive and you nip in the board and do not continue to say, um, to, to be reactive to the issues we have for security. I think the president missed it, his government missed it. Security would have been a very strong point. And if you recall, the very first few months of President Buhari's um, ascension to power, Many people were talking about the president's body language. And we find that people, even the public power sector that just went back to the discourse and what have you, people were beginning to say that, ah, there was electricity. Even the policemen who hit at all were collecting um, um, uh, bribes on the streets who were extorting motorists. They disappeared for a few days. And suddenly, when they saw that nothing was coming from the part of the presidency and the commander in chief, it became business as usual. When it took six months or thereabouts to appoint ministers, people now felt, ah, nothing is going to happen. So I think that, yes, the Financial Times is spot on. As far as security is concerned, that would have been one of the strongest points of this government. But unfortunately, that has not been a strong point. Police refor reforms, if you have law and order sorted, almost every under in this, in this index of development would build on law and order. But that's not what we've had. We've had a situation where people could no longer go to the farms. In the northeast and the northwest, even in the southwest, people were scared to go to the farms because you had all manner of criminals, even those who were not necessarily um, full and heads men. People were not cashing in on the franchise to go to stop people and kidnap people from the farm. So people could not go. Then the borders were closed. And when you closed the borders, and not, not, nothing was being done with regards to the home environment to ensure that there was a good purchasing power and you had. The, the food supply for people, what's going to happen? Insecurity is going to be the order of the day. So I think that the Financial Times is absolutely spot on. This is one area that the president should have shown, shown strength, and the strength for me has been lacking. We have been basically reactive. It has been a fire brigade approach. There is one issue, we react. There is another issue, we react. Rather than act like somebody who has actually wanted to be president 
at three other times before the fourth time you succeeded. So you must have a roadmap. You must have a blueprint on how you want to tackle this thing. It is not rocket science. We see how countries like Georgia and elsewhere tackled insecurity and the police, public sector. If your number one law and order agency is found to be irresponsive, is found to be lackluster, every other index that has to do with security would falter. And that's what we've had over time. All so right. yes, Herbert Shewu's position, that um, a reactionary position to the Financial Times, um, it doesn't distort the facts. The facts are there. All right, thank so you. The Jonathan you. was shown the whole out. The people felt he didn't do too much. You have come in six years, seven years down the line. What have we seen? All right, um, Shego, uh, let's um, talk um, more now. The uh, article also took a swipe uh, concerning uh, the way we go about our elections and the monetary uh, uh, monetization in the nation's um, politics and all of that. Uh, specifically, uh, if I have to read them um, verbatim, it said uh, the familiar candidate to replace um, him, that's um, the present administration, uh, mostly recycled old men are already counting their money ahead of a costly electoral marathon. It takes an estimated $2 billion to get a president elected. Those who pay will expect to be paid back. Does this really hit home, Shego? I mean, look, um, obviously... Um, the person that wrote this article knows Nigeria well enough um, to, to hit home at the key points um, that are affecting us. And, and, you know, we mustn't miss a very critical point that was made by that article, which is that, um, so he sort of made the point in passing and then went into that session that you read just now, you know, which is that the problem of Nigeria is not entirely a problem of this particular president, but a problem of a system. So, and he, the, the article went as far as to say, you you know, I mean, even if you change this president and whoever is coming up on board, so even if it's, um, you know, say the, the current vice president, for example, who perhaps has the goodwill of a lot of people um, and the trust of a lot of people, you know, that he probably still wouldn't do much better because the system itself needs to be tackled. And, you know, that then speaks to some of the issues that you've raised, you know, the nature of our elections, the monetization of, of, of the same, and the fact that you can't um, win any meaningful office in this country without spending tens, hundreds, and, you know, sometimes tens, hundreds of millions, and sometimes billions. Um, um, so then you, you come on board, and of course, you know, when you come on board, you want to recoup your, your investment in quotes, you know, so... Absolutely, the, the school is bottom. And now, the point that has to be made is whoever comes on board after um, this administration leaves must not make the same mistake that President Buhari made. President Buhari started failing when, within the first one year in office, he didn't tackle the fundamental reforms that must be tackled if this country is to do well. You know, so a president that means to to change the country the way they sang the chain mantra, you know, at that time, must address the civil service. You must reform the civil service and make it efficient and unbloated, if you like. You must re reform the police. You must reform the judiciary. You must deal with constitutional problems that we have. Any serious president that comes on board and fails to tackle those things in the first one and a half years, maximum two years, will fail. It's guaranteed. You know, so it will be a degree of failure rather than whether they can succeed or not. You know, and I think that's the point that that, that article was making. So let's say you get a Yemi Shibado or a, a Professor Kinsley Mogalu that is so popular with a lot of people, or maybe a Pat Tommy that has all, you know, is very erudite and all of that. If they fail to make those changes, those fundamental reforms and changes in the best few years or in the first few months of the administration, they'll fail because the system is rigged and designed to ensure that this, the, the, the process of governance is ineffective so that people can live off the rent that is created by the capture of state infrastructure, by the capture of, of, of the entire um, um, governance system by a certain clique of people. So that's where Buari failed right, right from the beginning. 
All right, uh, Efe, very quickly, uh, uh, because we're almost um, out of time. I just want to read part of um, the presidency's um, response, and I would want you to comment. Uh, let me just quote. The first comprehensive plan to deal with the decades um, old clashes between nomadic herders and sedentary farmers experienced across the weeds of the Sahel has been introduced. Pilot ranches are reducing the competition for water and land that drove past tensions. Banditry grew out of such clashes. Criminal gangs took advantage of instability flush with guns that flooded the region following the western triggered implosion of Libya. The situation is grave, yet as with other challenges, it's one that the government would face down. That's what the statement added. Basically, the, 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 the president was trying to explain how far you know, it has come with uh, the nomadic um, uh, headers issues uh, that we've had in the country. Would you really say that uh, we actually uh, are seeing them, or we are, it is who we yet in the country? Absolutely not. Absolutely. You, you recall that uh, at some point in time, many people, um, other than in the northwest and northeast of the country, believed that the issue of um, Headers, farmers clashes gained front burner position and prominence because of the perceived latent tacit support of the president being himself an ethnic Fulani. Now, this is the president that would have himself been at the best position to tackle the situation and solve it. For instance, you are aware that yes, the certification, climate change is causing people to come down to graze their cattle. But this is the 21st century. Argentina is believed to be the highest exporter of beef. So, do they have nomadic famine? What I would have expected the president to do, you don't, of course, just shut down the system entirely, but of course, you let them know this cannot continue indefinitely. So, you give a moratorium. You say within a year, for instance, all nomadic grazing of cattle in the country must stop. And the gov federal government will partner with states, local governments, and other agencies to support. Uh, um, creation of ranches across the country in different zones, and not the issue of um, water resources bill, and then Ruga, and water view, and not the issue of excusing. Remember when people were killed in Benue, and the response of the presidential spokesman, uh, Mr. Femi Adeshino, to the effect that uh, it is better to be alive, uh, and if you have to leave your land, leave your lands, and something to that effect. And that, and that was very uncalled for. It created the impression that the government of the day was giving tacit support to the marauding headsmen. That is one issue the president would have solved because if he had done the proper thing, even the full and in the man right, would have known that this man means well for us. He couldn't have um, um, meant uh, anything negative for us. All right, thank you so much, Ife. And of course, uh uh, Shegu, Shegu, uh, that's as much as we can take. We're completely out of time. If one way is a security expert, and Shegu Shukuta is a public affairs analyst and, of course, an economist. Many thanks, gentlemen, for sharing your thoughts on this particular issue with us tonight. We do appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Pleasure. And now to round off, we'll let you know what Nigerians have to say about the government's seriousness in the fight against insecurity. My name is Justin Akademi. Plus Politics returns again soon. Stay with us. The case of insecurity is not something uh, that can just be handled at once like that. It's a complicated matter. And it's obvious that the president is making some efforts. And it is not something that can just be done at once. So let, let us be, believe that some of the efforts that have been made we eat fruit, but it's obvious that uh, efforts have been made. So it's just left to different agencies to ensure that um, they, they, uh, they, they heart to what they are doing, uh, because it's becoming uh, more complicated almost every day. I don't think so. Why? The reason being this, because this is not the, the beginning, and it's not the... Uh, this thing, has not, this thing has not started today. Okay. It has been starting for a very long time. We should be clamoring on them too. Up to now, they've not been able to do anything. So I don't think it's government um, issues, but it's only God intervention that can really help us out in this case. Well, uh, with the look of things, I'm, I'm not sure the government is ready or the uh, president, because uh, I expect them to have put a lot of uh, measures in place at the moment to solve insecurity and possibly to put people's mind at rest because uh, people are agitated, you know. We want to do Christmas and New Year with peace of mind, with our family, you understand? But many people don't want to travel. Like me, for, for example, I just want to stay in one place. 
of course, I think he's, he's, been, he's doing his best. I mean, what can one do? You have your security operatives. They are the people that will uh, have to go and uh, confront uh, whosoever is creating problems. The, the president needs to give his support, provide whatever they need. I think that's, uh, I think he's, he's trying his best. It is like the president is just like ignoring the insecurity in Nigeria because every day you hear new new news like in different states of something something happening. So I don't think the president is ready to really tackle the issue yet as of now. So it's more like it's something that the government is just ignoring. And we itself in this in this place we are kind of in like Lagos. That's what I mean. We are kind of. Uh, shut down, shut off from the news, like we don't even know much of what is going. But when you really take a look at other people that are in other states, like far states, like Shokoto, Josa, no, then you get to see the reality of things that are going on in Nigeria, and it's not, it's not a good thing.